All right, so it's one o'clock, so let's begin. So welcome to Advocacy Through a Queer Lens panel, which is hosted by Women's Advocates. Uh, we are funded in part by Ramsey County Public Health. So thank you for Ramsey County for helping partially fund our program. And welcome everyone to the panel. Feel free again to introduce yourselves in the chat while we begin. So I'm going to begin by reading our land acknowledgement as we do before every presentation that we give. So women's advocates work takes place on Dakota land, the area that is now St. Paul was stolen from the Dakota people by the American government through centuries of war, broken treaties and acts of cultural genocide. Through incredible perseverance and resistance, the Dakota are still here and strong. Native women and girls face the highest risk of domestic violence, sexual assault, and intimate partner homicide. We express our gratitude for the Indigenous-led organizations who are working each day towards a world without domestic and sexual violence. And as an organization, we commit ourselves to supporting tribal sovereignty with the same fervor that we support the self-sovereignty -sov of victim survivors. I am going to put that land acknowledgement in the chat as well. So today we are going to do some introductions, then we're going to break it up into some sections. So we're going to talk where we've been, where we are now, where we're going, and engaging with the community, and some final questions. So some reminders before we begin, take care of yourselves during this webinar. PowerPoint slides and certificate of attendance will be available at the end of the presentation. There will be a QR code that you can scan to download that certificate. Recording of this webinar will be emailed along with all of the other resources that we provide. And we will be using LGBTQ plus to talk about the overall community. The community, however, is very diverse and we want to acknowledge the multi-layered identities in our community. So we're going to start by meeting our panelists. So I'm going to start, my name is Joe. I'm a community outreach advocate here at Women's Advocates. We uh, do a lot of different things, including pop-up every Tuesday and Thursday, which I'll talk about later in the pr uh, presentation. I think it's important for me to be part of the conversation as a male-bodied person to talk about domestic violence, keeping, um, and especially for what it's like for queer folks in the community and how, how we access resources. Um, I have a BA in Women's Studies and Ethnic Studies from Bowling Green State University. I graduated in 2008. And I've been at Women's Advocates for almost six months now. It's a joy to do this kind of work. And so now I'm going to let the other uh, panelists speak about who they are and why they're here. So Mary Beth. Hi, um, I'm Mary Beth becker -Loss. I use she, her pronouns. I'm the Community Education and Outreach Manager at Women's Advocates. Um, for now, I'll be moving into a grants management position later in the year, um, but I, um, I'm really excited to be a part of this panel. Um, I've been I've been in outreach for a couple of years here at WA now, and I've always wanted to put together some sort of LGBTQ plus discussion. Um, and we never had enough of us to to put together a panel, um, and so now I'm just really thrilled that like we have. Um, I feel like uh, queer people in the anti domestic violence movement have kind of reached critical mass, um, and we can we can have more of these conversations on more of a public platform. Um, I I think it's really important for me to be here today because I am, I mean, I'm a lesbian woman. I got into domestic violence advocacy because I just, I love women and I want them to succeed. Um, and at the same time, I, I recognize that not everybody who is a victim survivor is a woman. And also our, our experiences of abuse look very different depending on our sexualities sometimes um, and our gender identities. So I'm really looking forward to hearing what everybody else has to say about that. Awesome. So now we have Sam followed by Sean. Hey y'all, my name is Sam. My pronouns are they, them, theirs, and I am one of three housing stability advocates at Women's Advocates. 
So I'm super excited that I get to be here representing the team and the work that we do. I have been, ironically, I've been at Women's Advocates the longest out of everybody on our housing team, but the, I have the shortest tenure on our housing team. So it's a great dichotomy, super fun. Um, and it was especially important for me to be here today because I think domestic violence work is very targeted towards women that share that they are cis and straight. And unless we're very intentional about making our making it very like, clear that our spaces are for everyone and our spaces are open and accessible to folks who may not identify as female and may not identify as straight, you know, there's a lot of work that needs to happen there. So I really always, it's very important to me to keep the conversations going and just to know that our participants and our residents know that we are here, we're here to support them in that process. All right, and hey, hello everyone. My name is Sean Hayes and my pronouns are he, him, and his. And I am coming to you from Duluth, Minnesota. Uh, I work full-time at a place called Men as Peacemakers which is a primary prevention organization. Um, we sort of describe that as our goal is to stop the harm before it happens. And how do we do that within community and, and with community's help? So within that, I am the program coordinator for the Don't Buy It project, which specifically looks at ending commercial sexual exploitation, including uh, sex trafficking um, and other forms of exploitation that are happening. I also co-coordinate a uh, statewide coalition called the Men and Masculine Folks Network, um, where our goal there is to connect with men and masculine folks, as you may have imagined, uh, across the state of Minnesota, folks who are doing this type of work, folks who have been impacted by it and, and want to get more involved with organizing around that. Um, so that is um, one of my favorite things. Um, and then I am also the co-founder and chair of an organization in Duluth called Trans Northland that seeks to provide services of all kinds, any and everything that folks are looking for to transgender folks, including gender expansive folks, non-binary, uh, two-spirit, uh, and anyone else who identifies under the transgender umbrella. So I'm very happy to be here with all of you. All right, so now we have Haley followed by Sang. Good afternoon, my name's Haley. I use she, they pronouns. I am a family advocate with Esperanza United. I've been with the organization for six years and I've been a family advocate for two. Um, Esperanza United, the mission is to mobilize uh, Latinas and Latino communities to end domestic violence. Um, and for me, it was very important to be here today because one of the things that I am very adamant in my work about is that domestic violence does not know gender, does not know race, it does not know sexuality, it can impact anyone and everyone. And I think a lot of the community perception of domestic violence is very gendered and it's very, it's viewed through a very cis head lens. So for me, it was important to be here on this panel today to just talk about that a little bit more. Hello, everyone. My name is Sang. I use they, them pronouns. I serve as the queer justice coordinator at an organization called Transforming Generations, based in St. Paul. I've been with them for two and a half years now. Um, in my role, I look to support a lot of queer and trans folks who are Hmong or Southeast Asians um, navigating uh, the likes of uh, intimate partner violence, to exploring gender identity, um, uh, navigating family violence. And I think why I am so just excited to be part of this conversation today is to not only share space with incredible folks who are doing this work and have their share of wisdom and experience to um, impart today. Um, I think to also really share about my own understandings, uh, the observations that I've seen in the past couple of years that I've been doing this work um, that's prevalent within um, the Hmong population that's um, that's here that I work with um, and how domestic violence looks like 
looks culturally specific uh, within our community. Um, be it, it does, it really does no, um, have, have no boundaries about the race, the gender of people that it, um, it can impact. But I think there's something to unpack about how it looks like for Hmong, queer and trans folks um, and other communities that are marginalized by race, gender, sexuality, um, et cetera. So I'm so happy to be here. I am just still so thrilled that all of you are here. It's such a diverse, really cool panel and I'm really excited to get started. So before we do that, let's do work cloud. So we have quite a few people here. Feel free to scan the, or the QR code that is on there and just tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, I believe that there's also a link that will be put in the chat here momentarily. Um, if you can't scan the code, so you can just click that link and then we will a gander at that. So I'm gonna give you all a few moments to do that. And when we're ready, we'll share it, uh, share it all for you. Yeah, um, you can either scan that QR code to enter in your, your words, or you can go to menti.com and you can enter in the code 68033731. And that's panelists and attendees. We'd love to see some, see some people put stuff in. Oh, or Joe, let me share my screen so we can um, so we can see the the words filling in. Please hold. Yay. I love these. And um, in as happens with word clouds, the more um, the more a word is entered, the bigger it becomes. So it seems like a lot of people are advocates. A lot of I also people really are love. Queer. I love the word queer. I do, I I know some people don't, but I I just I like it for myself. I also like seeing all the diversity of words. Ooh, and I love that we have survivors. Here. Yeah. Yeah. Somebody in here um, talking about liberation theology. Um, hit me up, maybe. Let's talk. Um. Also, I love that we have white, straight, cisgender people here because we need allies. Like the community cannot function without allyship. At least from my own opinion. I love it. Like it just, it keeps getting bigger and bigger. Yeah. We'll go back at, we can look back at it at the end too when we yeah. are. Um, we have a word cloud coming at you at the end too. Um, so we'll we'll see. We'll see what else this looks like later. Um, All right. So let's get into it. So where have we been? So for all of you in the chat, what do you think life was like or, or what do you think the lives of the advocates were like back in the 1970s? And what do you think life was like before the domestic violence eradication movement happened? I'm curious to see what you all have to say. Because the panel is not just us about us talking, it's also we want to hear, we want to hear other people's thoughts. It's an interactive panel. Maybe advocates not being taken seriously, absolutely. Struggling for funding, still, 
still doing that. To be honest, I'm not sure I was born in 1998. Okay, I feel old now, um, but I don't. I don't think a lot of us were were around in the 70s. I, but I, I think that you know, like I think we can make assumptions of what it was like. Erasure and invisible, fearless and resilient, fighting for the rights of people. I love all of those answers. So I wanted to talk a little bit about what life was like in the 1970s, like where, why the movement started the way it did. So I think it's also important to say that domestic violence didn't just magically happen in the 1970s. It was going on for millennia. Like th this has always been a thing. It's just in the 1970s is when the movement really happened. Um, so you can see that we have a picture of the women's rally in City Hall Plaza in Boston. And I also have an ad from Miss Magazine in 1973. Uh, the move, like the movement really started in the early 70s. So uh, Miss Magazine had a thing where it would ask people to send in ads that they see that were anti-woman and, and pro-domestic violence. So here we have an ad from 1973 um, to basically make light of wife beating. I also wanted to talk some a little bit old briefly about lesbianism in the 1970s. So we have some radical feminists here. One of my favorites is Audre Lorde, who is in the middle. Um, Sister Outsider is a good book. I suggest everybody read that book. Um, third wave feminism really talks a lot about the intersectionalities of, I, of feminism and of the women's movement. So Audre Lorde in particular was a black lesbian feminist and a really cool one at that. Um, and then we also have Alex Dobkin, who worked with the Lavender Menace movement, or the L Lavender Menace movement, which was a lesbian movement from the 1970s. You can see a little picture in that corner. And then we have Betty Friedan, who is not a lesbian, but was anti-lesbian, part of the second wave. So there was a struggle between the second wave of feminism and the third wave of feminism. Second wave didn't really want to let the lesbians in and the lesbians kind of demanded that they were gonna be a part of the movement. And so I also have some links to some interesting reading for you, which I will provide at the end of the presentation. I just like, I, I'm still not over this. Um, <laughs> I'm still not over Betty Friedan being on this slide because like Betty Friedan, you guys, Betty Friedan coined the term lavender menace to describe lesbians who she thought were undermining the feminist movement by saying, hey, some of us women are lesbians. Um, she was, she really thought that um, the, the lesbian feminists were distracting from the ultimate goal of, uh, of her feminism, which was um, liberating heterosexual women, mostly heterosexual white women. Um, and so I just like, I think it's very fun to have her on the slide with a bunch of lesbians that she probably would not have cared for. Um, I just think it's really fun. And I think it's also worth noting, like there, there were no prominent men in the movement at this time because it's it's not a man's issue, it's a woman's issue. So you don't see men in advocacy, not necessarily because they don't want to, but because I think they were excluded, at least in my opinion. Um, so early general shelter philosophy, originally a safe place to become or to come to to leave their husbands due to domestic violence and not be homeless. So it was seen as a third option, essentially. Um, so not to lose their kids, but not to stay, not to be homeless, not to stay in that situation. It's seen through a heterosexual lens. Ideologically, domestic violence was solely a heterosexual issue, as we've talked about. 
And queer women were often turned away due to homophobia and confusion and how to handle situations. So a lesbian would show up to a domestic violence shelter and people would say, hey, I don't know if you're really the one doing the abuse. Maybe it was this other woman. So who, who do we believe? And so because that was a common thing, no, nobody got help because they couldn't, they didn't know how to handle it. So let's start with our first round of questions. So tell us about the history of your organization. Were LGBTQ plus people involved in its founding or in the early stages and were they out and or visible? I'd like to pass this one off to Mary Beth. Okay. Um, Women's Advocates was founded in 1972. Um, so as the very first domestic violence shelter in the country. So um, kind of like all of the early movement stuff that we're talking about, that's like Women's Advocates was doing that. We were like, our, our people were kind of a, a collective uh, college educated women who just um, really cared and thought that we needed, that there needed to be a safe place for people to go who are being abused, well, women to go who are being abused. Um, there's not a particularly strong record of um, if any of those founding members of Women's Advocates were gay or lesbian or any sort of flavor of LGBTQ, um, there's not a lot of evidence um, to that fact, and that's like pretty standard. I think a lot of um, a lot of advocates at the time, a lot of domestic violence advocates in the movement at the time, who were um, who were lesbians as the field professionalized, um, a lot of them went into the closet. So maybe they were out at the beginning, um, or they were they were actively like housing domestic violence survivors in their apartment that they shared with their with their partner or their lover or roommate. Um, that started to kind of go away um, in the in the late eighties, early nineties, as um, federal funding started happening and people were starting to have to conform to government requirements. Um, I hope that they were there is really what I can say about um, LGBTQ people at the beginning of women's advocates history. Uh, it would not surprise me, but we don't know for sure. And I'd love to hear about the rest of your organizations as well. Just jump in, let, let me hear, let me hear about your histories. Sure. So our organization was founded in 1982. Um, and the first advocates and staff members that were out, like part of the LGBTQ plus community, were in the early 1990s. So if there were people who were involved in founding the organization who were part of the community, they were not out. We didn't know about them. Um, and basically, one of the first government grants that we ever got was actually for lesbian and gay Latino survivors. So we've been working with LGBTQ survivors since the beginning, but I do not think that any people involved in the founding of the organization were out members of the community. Yeah, our organization um, was founded in 2016, Transforming Generations. Um, I think none of the founders, um, I, there were four of them, are queer themselves, but have been involved with a lot of the queer justice work that's specifically within the Hmong community here in Minnesota. Um, and with those ties, um, still early on in the development uh, uh, of this space, uh, this um, organization that's dedicated to ending gender-based violence, um, brought in um, people who were queer in Hmong and so one of those folks that were inducted in as the queer justice coordinator, uh, queer justice director, actually, her name is Sei Yang. Uh, she's been very instrumental um, to continue um, creating the foundation that this work around domestic violence, uh, um, gender-based violence, uh, and the advocacy around it was inclusive of queer and trans folks, um, because 
we we understand the root of these forms of violence are are from patriarchy, um, patriarchy within the Hmong community, and patriarchy from a, a white colonial lens as well. And so, um, there was a need to know that anyone who didn't un understand the need for queer justice work with our organization um, was just uh, it's not the right place. Um, and it's definitely a part of the liberation that we're looking to create. Uh, and so we have now folks, several folks, myself included, who are queer and trans on staff and continue to invest more into these um, into these leaders that offer really, really specific and really needed lens around ending gender based violence and domestic violence in our communities. Um, and um, we we hope to be loud as hell. So <laughs> um, yeah, I'll pass it off to other folks. I can jump in here. So um, a little bit about uh, Men as Peacemakers. Our story starts in the mid 90s here in Duluth, Minnesota. Um, and the stories that I have heard and learned about that history is that at the time when our organization was founded or shortly leading up to that, there had been several domestic violence homicides that had happened here in Duluth, Minnesota. And so in response to that, um, I think our website says there was a diverse group of men, about 100 people, uh, who went um, on a retreat and really um, asked a lot of questions about why is this happening? We're seeing this pattern happening in the community. Um, we're seeing that it's men, cisgender, heterosexual men who are committing um, these harms and, and these uh, murders. Um, and so what is the role of men Men at that time? I don't know if we were using um, and including masculine and identifying folks back then, but um, yeah, these guys just got together and said, actually, men have a really important role within uh, the violence prevention movement because we're oftentimes the ones causing harm. And then we are also oftentimes the people who have the most power and privilege to speak with other men and mask folks to educate, to call out, to um, to share what we've learned right through this work that we do. Um, and I'm not positive, actually, if there were queer and trans folks um, involved back then. Um, what I can say now is I think we have a staff of 13 folks and about half of us are uh, queer and or trans identifying, um, which, you know, feels so good as a queer trans guy um, to be able to work in a community of folks who do really see the value of bringing in all of the folks who are on those margins um, and really trying to expand how we do this work. Um, and you know, I think saying what you were sharing about like the root causes, that's that's a big part of our prevention work is looking at those root causes. How how does this violence happen? What are the the forms of oppression really that allow it to happen? And, and so a lot of our programming, well, all of our programming here now um, does come from a queer and trans um, framework. Um, we also um, do a lot of work around the habits of white supremacy and how that shows up within organizations that do this work. Um, so yeah, I feel very grateful to work at a place now where it is really valued. Um, and our current uh, executive director, her name is Sarah Curtis. Um, she could talk your ear off about, she calls it administrative liberation. Um, and so she has done a lot, a lot of work over the years that she's been here to really look at the policies within our organization, um, looking at uh, job descriptions when we have um, positions open, you know, making sure that affectional preference, gender identity, sexual orientation, all of those things are specifically said, like none of that um, will bar you from um, being a part of our work and our organization and, and really try to reach out um, to get more queer and trans folks in. I don't think I've ever heard the term affectional preference till just now. And I that's what I love about our community is that we always have this really cool language to, to talk about our experiences. Before we move on, because we work at the same organization, Sam, did you wanna talk a little bit about like how you think the history of Women's Advocates was? 
Honestly, Mary Beth hit everything I probably would have mentioned <laughs> and extra. So I'm going to, um, I'll let her take this one. <laughs> All right. So let's move on to question two then. Did LGBTQ plus folks seek support from your organization in its early stages? What were their experiences? If there weren't any LGBTQ plus folks who sought support from your organization, why do you think that was the case? Let's start with Sean for this one. All right, uh, thank you. So um, Menace Peacemakers, we have several different programs. So I'll just say that. Um, and one of the programs um, where we see um, this type of dynamic come up a lot um, is within our uh, domestic violence restorative circles program, which has been going, I believe, since, um, oh gosh, I shouldn't actually say, I don't know for sure, but at least uh, seven to eight years we've had that program running. Um, and it, it works with repeat offenders of domestic violence, folks who've been incarcerated multiple times, and then as a part of their probation or parole, they um, sign up and they get into this program. And um, so the vast majority of those folks have been cis het men. Um, and I do know that there were a couple of um, uh, lesbian couples who came in early on um, and the feedback and what I've heard about that was that it basically was not good um, because they had not um, at that point in our organization, we had really not done that work yet of um, looking at what those um, dynamics of violence look like for queer folks. Um, and I think it was Mary Beth, uh, or I'm sorry, someone mentioned, you know, that that whole idea of like, well, who's really causing the harm? Who's really experiencing harm? And how do we, you know, who do we believe? Um, and so since then, I think, you know, that program has continued to really focus towards cis het men who have caused harm. Um, but one of the things that I also um, want to say in this is that, um, you know, I've been here going on about seven years. And when I first started, I was doing more of an administrative role. And then my work within Trans Northland, um, it was formerly known as Trans Plus, I was um, working with and engaging with lots of trans folks, uh, gender expansive folks who had been, you know, actively experiencing harm within community. And so sort of through bringing those stories and those, um, um, those incidents to light here within our community at MAP, um, it really sort of helped us start digging deeper into how can we actually really make a point to include uh, queer and trans folks. And, and so um, because we're a primary prevention agency, we don't actually offer direct services, so we don't have a shelter um, or respond directly to folks in crisis. Um, but yeah, just all of our programming, um, whether it's working with young kids, um, we have a program called MEGA uh, that stands for Making Equal Genders Awesome where our youth workers go into the schools here locally in Duluth um, and they, these students self-select from fourth grade all the way up to 12th grade. We have programming um, where we are really infusing all of that programming with um, conversations around gender equity, around, you know, trans 101 type things and just really um, bringing our community um, forward in the conversations. And I love hearing those stories from the kids who are just like, what's a pronoun or, you know, and then they're like, oh, okay, cool. You know, and, the, you know, so many of them, I think our youth and young people are, um, they really just don't have the same struggles with understanding, um, even if they don't identify that way. Um, and so, yeah, I think now, I feel pretty proud of where our organization is now and, and um, so many folks within community feel safe to come and just hang out and grab a cup of coffee at MAP. Um, and then we also make a point to put out the fact that we have gender inclusive bathrooms here that are open to the public as well. So just offering safe spaces to folks in community that when they need it, they can come in. Uh, whether or not they need support or they're ready to acknowledge or, or talk about the support that they need, just trying to start those relationships.
Would anyone else like to answer this question? I'm I'm so curious about, yeah, go, go for it, Sam. I can, because I've been thinking big, hard thoughts about this. Um, so I think some, especially because this is something that's routinely come up in conversation throughout my time at Women's Advocates. So I think one piece to look at, you know, is we all know what data tells us, but what is our data not telling us, right? So, and our way of collecting data has changed over the years, like, and there's big gaps we know from when we first started to now, like, if you were to look at not number data, like, even just like how we document the work we do, like in media, um, there's this, a couple decades, like, gap where you just can't find anything, like, pictures weren't being taken, stories weren't being shared, written down, not, like, held. So, A, what is our, what's our, data, however you want to look at it, not telling us about who's using our services and who's reaching out to us and looking for support. I think it's a thing. B, like, it's kind of inherent in our name. If you're looking at an organization called Women's Advocates, that's super telling about who that looks at that and feels like they can access our services and who can't. And I think if you're looking at, you know, second wave feminism by the time that we were founded was... I'm going to pretend I can do math here, like three quarters of the way through. I don't think that's right, but we'll go with it. Um, how is that interacting? Like people looking at services, what services they can access. And I think on top of all this, who's sharing how they identify? Like for whatever reason, are there are people choosing to not disclose their gender or sexuality for safety reasons? Is it for fear that they would be turned away and that they wouldn't be able to Use user user services. So I think there's this whole messy mishmash of circumstances that led us to unfortunately having like not a lot of queer folks interacting with women's advocates up until recently, and even recently, like it's few and far between. I would argue. Occasionally, there's someone that feels comfortable in like coming out and sharing it and sharing with staff, sharing with some staff, sharing with all. But like as a whole, this is something that we're still looking at, and we're still not, I think, seeing a lot of queer folks coming into coming into shelters specifically. Yeah, um, I hard agree with that, Sam, and especially like. Because I know you've been like really interested in our archival material, like for for those who are for those watching at home. Um, Sam is the person who has gone through all of our women's advocates scrapbooks from uh, the seventies, eighties, and nineties, um, and um, has been kind of our like history keeper. Um, and I think you're right. Like we we kind of have to assume because like we've always existed, right? Like queer people have always been here. Um, and so we have to assume that we were there, but we don't have proof of our existence. And yes, uh, Lindsay, you are super right, or sorry, um, in the chat, you are super right. Um, a lot of people misstate the relationship uh, in same-sex domestic violence calls um, or like can't understand what the relationship is in domestic calls. Uh, same-sex domestics get referred often as strains or stranger assaults um, because and they were roommates. Um, but yeah, I think we've always been here. We've always been in, in the movement. We've always been experiencing violence and needing support. It's just a matter of um, are we documented? Are we are we spoken about? Um, are we pointed to as um, something to be proud of? And I I think in some places, in some um, parts of the movement and organizations, maybe maybe we aren't. Um, maybe our our complexity um, is too much. Uh, is too much for those. For, for parts of other parts of the movement to handle. Um, and maybe that's why we get lost. Um, but I, I, do, I, I have to believe we were there. I have to believe that we, we existed and we're like out there seeking support. It's just a matter of like whether we were, we were announcing ourselves in that way. Um, 
But Haley, I was really curious because you said one of your first grants at Esperanza was um, for a gay and lesbian survivors project. Can we can we talk about that? Not to like hijack your moderating, Joe, but like, can we can we talk about that? Sure. If you guys are, if we have time, we can talk about that a little bit. Um, so first of all, we are a culturally specific organization. We work with the Latino population. And from, I will give almost all the credit to the advocates because upon speaking with my director when we were preparing for this webinar, she was very clear and I wanna honor that the advocates who were part of the lesbian community who were bisexual, they were the ones who really pushed the organization to accept the LGBTQ community. and they were the ones who sort of made this organization more welcoming and sort of drove that forward. And they were part of how we got that grant to work with lesbian survivors. So we were the first programming for LGBTQ Latino survivors. Um, something that I do wanna honor is that at the beginning, it was mostly work with people who identified as lesbians. Um, in the shelter, we began as a shelter program, and I believe the shelter was begun in 1985. And our shelter has always accepted people who identify as female. Um, I believe we do accept gender expansive folks now. I don't know when that started, and we haven't had a lot, um, at least in my time there. Um, one of the shortcomings, I think, is the organization has always been tried to be very inclusive and continue evolving and accepting the community. Um, but we were not one of the organizations from the beginning who were working directly with men. And so we were doing referrals out for men. And then a couple things happened. So first of all, again, there was a push from the advocates to be more inclusive and accept all members of the LGBTQ community. And there was also an increase in calls and an increase in men seeking services. And so we began again expanding our capacity to work with male survivors, um, no matter their sexual orientation or anything like that, about six years ago. And so now we do have male participants in the community, but I think one of our shortcomings is still that we do not accept men in the shelter. Um, we would only accept youth who are. Um, boys and men who are under 18 years old or family members of the women who have been accepted. So, yeah, I mean, we've had, we've done a lot of trainings on domestic violence that exists within the LGBTQ community. We made a video, it's called My Girlfriend Did It. I think they made that in 1994. That's still up on our website, that is put if you're interested. Um, but I think, you know, we've done a lot and I'm personally pretty proud of how the organization started and how it's been at the forefront of including Latino LGBTQ survivors. But I think also we did have some shortcomings and we still have a long way to go. Thing I would love to hear about transforming generations and what that was like for at the beginning. Yeah, um, so in the founding back in 2016, um, there was no funding for the folks that just started and curated this um, space uh, of four people trying to end gender-based violence in the Hmong community and Southeast Asian communities. Um, and a lot, of, a lot of the work at that time was just about workshopping and providing shared language and understandings about what, what does DVSV look like in Hmong in Southeast Asian communities. Um, and a lot of that work is volunteer, volunteer work. Um, while these these people held full-time jobs, had their own families, had um, other work projects that they um, were involved in. And then up until 2019 was when Transforming Generations got um, its, I think, first state and federal um, funding to allow for direct services around advocacy work. Um, and so, um, this work also is, um, it comes from the legacy of uh, an organization that was dedicated to Hmong LGBTQ people here in the Twin Cities called Shades of Yellow, uh, which closed back in 2017. Um, 
after its closing, there was no center point or organization uh, that specifically serviced this um, demographic of folks, where at the time these people in 2016 were kind of um, gauging the need for culturally specific, specific services for Hmong um, survivors of gender-based violence. Um, it very much so entailed uh, Hmong queer and trans people uh, and the need for early on to bring on a queer justice director. Um, and so uh, stemming from that, the advocacy work included queer and trans people. I would say maybe not much uh, inquiries. Um, I think as, as it is, a, it's such a big taboo in general for people of a variety of communities um, bringing up the subject matter of domestic violence and sexual violence. Um, and then and more so with Hmong, Hmong community members who um, have, have um, the layers and uh, the layers of oppression around white supremacy, around capitalism, around um, patriarchy. It's it is hard to get to a place where queer and trans people can understand that some of the unhealthy relationships that they've been through were actually abusive and were actually toxic because of the layerings of homophobia and not wanting to disclose such information to compound that further harm of uh, for more harm uh, about well you wouldn't have experienced domestic violence in your your queer relationships if you weren't gay or if you weren't lesbian etc cetera, etc cetera. and so i think we're getting to a place um within our our cultural understanding about you know as we stated at the beginning domestic violence um, it knows no bounds about race, gender, culture. It just looks different within our communities. And what is the willingness of uh, of those of us who are willing to speak about it and to to advocate about how we can prevent these things from happening? Um, and so, some of the first requests that we were getting when it came to um, queer and trans folks were just really about addressing family violence and giving language and shared understandings about, you know, how can we just um, how can we just garner acceptance, give uh, language that's both in Hmong and in English uh, to identify people as gay, trans, non-binary, um, being in um, same gender loving ex relationships or um, pansexual relationships, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and by way of that, I think, um, we're getting to places now that we can start to address some of the intimate partner violences within queer specific relationships uh, as Hmong people. Um, and so that I think we're kind of getting into those points of our work uh, that I foresee that we'll be starting to like, that we'll be starting to have more conversations about and how we can have more direct services for that in our culture specific work. Yeah. Well Amazing. I love all of your answers. So uh, for question three, what are some of the challenges that LGBTQ plus advocates faced at the beginning of the anti-domestic violence movement? Um, I, before I open this question up to the rest of the panel, I would imagine that in the 1970s, it was really hard to be out. Like that, like they were just when we, when we think about Stonewall, when we think about the history of the movement itself, like back then, like you, you couldn't wear the articles of the opposite gender's clothing. So to have the lesbians in the movement who did and then were just visible, but not visible because back then we had a queer code. So people knew who we were. Not that I was there because I wasn't there, but I've watched documentaries. So um, I want to open up the to the rest of the panel. Like, what do you think the advocates back then faced? I'll start with Keely for this one. Um, so I think that, um, and just based on the stories that I've heard about our organization, one of the challenges that 
these advocates faced is that there just wasn't a lot, there wasn't a lot of knowledge about the queer community and just the general community at large. So I heard that there were some stories where, you know, they would be talking about, for example, so Spanish is a gendered language. So they would be talking about partners and someone would ask, well, do you have, like, do you have a boyfriend? And it ends in an, oh, it's novio, which is a boyfriend. And they would say, no, I have a girlfriend. I have a novia. And there were instances where the participants would be like correcting them and being like, no, 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 do you a boyfriend, not a girlfriend? Like, this isn't right. This is wrong. And they'd have to be like, no, it's, I have a girlfriend. I live with a woman, things like that. But I think, I mean, to be honest, I'm sure we've always been here, right? The queer community has always been here. So I'm sure that there were advocates in the 80s at the beginning of our organization who were LGBTQ plus and weren't out. And I can't imagine how challenging that must have been. But yeah. Yeah, I think the um the um the the gendered language um I mean, we we don't as much have that issue in, in English, but we do still like the word girlfriend can be interpreted in so many different ways. Um, and, and so there is confusion there too. Um, but I think um, from what I have, have read and heard, um, and as somebody is mentioning in the chat, our gal, Dr. Ellen Pence was indeed a lesbian um, who uh, developed the power and control wheel. Um, big fan, uh, nothing but respect for my president. Um, but I, I do think um, there were, there was a big challenge of, um, because of Betty Friedan's whole like, lesbians and gay people are, are distracting from the movement for women's liberation. I think there was a lot of challenge uh, that that folks had about how um, how do I be in both worlds? Um, that I think Audre Lorde started to answer that question and, and started to say that's not even the question we should be asking. Um, but I think prior to that, a lot of people were figuring out, okay, well, do I silence my queerness to engage in this women's liberation movement, or do I silence my feminism to engage in queer liberation? Um, and I'm just very grateful that a couple of scholars and feminist activists came out and said, you don't have to do either of those things, because um, I think that opened up the movement for a lot of us. I was just gonna say uh, one of the things that's kind of for me is just thinking about um, the LGBTQ plus movement you know, starting kind of right around that same time, right? Like we had Stonewall happen in I believe '68, Compton cafeteria riots happened even a year or two before that. Um, and so when I think about this question specifically for like advocates within this movement of domestic violence and you know, um, I just think about the the complexities of like folks are just now starting to fight for their own rights, right? Gay rights at that time. Um, and thinking about what all was happening after that, right? We had the first like gay rights march and I think it was 69 or 70 in DC. Um, and then, you know, followed by the AIDS epidemic and all of these things um, were just really huge challenges, right? Within the queer and trans community. Um, and so I just, you know, I'm just like trying to fathom what that must have been like to just, you know, because we have come so far in terms of um, pushing forward queer and trans rights in general, but there's still so much work to be done here. And so just trying to imagine what that would have been like to be someone working within community who holds those identities, possibly multiple identities, right? If they're trans and or queer, um, and just trying to survive as a queer trans person in community. Um, and then also, um, and we'll probably get to this later, but I just think about how 
you know, in our community, and even when I started doing this organizing work about nine years ago, um, within the trans community, it's just so much been focused on, we take care of us, like we know, and we can understand the complexities and the nuances around how violence shows up in our relationships. Um, saying I really like that you brought up like family violence as well, because I think about transphobia and homophobia in general are violence. Um, and so just folks trying to survive um, that. So I just, I'm sure there were tons, tons um, who are probably still alive to this day um, who did this work, but possibly didn't actually get recognition. They were doing it within their own, you know, local communities and, and just trying to provide their folks with resources. Um, so grateful, grateful. I think a lot about our elders, you know, especially June Pride Month and, and ancestors and ancestors who came before us um, in a time that would have been a lot harsher, I think, to be out and to be doing this work. I love the word transcestor. I also love the word transistor and sorry, my computer just decided to, to play a game on me. So I also think it's important before we move on to say like the history of our, all of our organizations really shaped like how queer people today access service or access service. So let's move on. So while we move on to the next questions for the attendees, uh, what do you think are the struggles for LGBTQ advocates right now? And what do you think are the struggles for LGBTQ residents or folks seeking domestic violence advocacy? While you all answer that in the chat, let's uh, open the questions up for the second part of this. So for this one, I'm going to read all the questions and then pick what y'all want to answer. So uh, question one, your own advocacy. How do you handle homophobia, transphobia, misgendering in your organization as an employee and as an advocate? Is your response to homophobia, transphobia different when it comes from a client versus a coworker? Uh, question two, uh, you and your organization, have you ever experienced a sense of not belonging in advocacy due to your LGBTQ plus identity? Or reminds you and reaffirms for you that LGBTQ plus people have a place in this movement? And question three, your organization. How does your organization amplify LGBTQ plus voices? How does it address the needs of the LGBTQ people seeking services? And what support are available for LGBTQ people through your organization? Before I open up to the panel, I have to just shout out women's advocates. I think that as an organization, we are so diverse and I, I have never felt at an organization, at any job, that I belong exactly as I am in it. So I think that's really cool. And with that, I will open it up to the panel and whoever wants to begin. Oh, I can start. <laughs> if you guys are cool with it. Um, I could do a whole TED talk on this. This would be like its own webinar, a two and a half hour webinar or whatever. Um, but in the time I've been at Women's Advocates, and I think Mary Beth can um, definitely relate to this, like we've seen so much change in this area. The thing, way situations, experiences were handled when I first started versus how they hand, are handled now isn't necessarily night and day. It's more like dawn and twilight. You know, there is some change and it's been really, really neat. Um, to be frank, I think when I started supporting, I I never didn't feel supported. Like I felt like my coworkers had my back. I felt confident that I could come out to my coworkers. But you know, conversations around the LGBTQ plus community, it was a choice. Conversations around race, ethnicity, how that impacts people's experience in the world and their experience with DV and getting services and the services that they need as they're, you know, working on their goals and shelter. Like that was an expectation. 
there was always an expectation that this is something we talk about and we address and we confront and we work to create change. But talking about the queer community, supporting the queer community was a choice. And over time that's changed. So I think we've all as coworkers begun to hold each other to a much higher standard. You know, with our folks coming into shelter, there's a, hey, this might be a new topic. Let's talk about the basics, but with coworkers, it's okay. We've done presentations every year, at least four years in a row. Come on now, we're done with this. This this isn't a new topic. You guys, you gotta get, get, yourself, get yourselves together. So there's a lot of a higher accountability for each other. And, but at the same time, the thing that's never changed is as, and I'm only speaking for myself here, as an advocate, I've never not felt backed by my coworkers. I think so. I will be very honest. I have been very fortunate and my coworkers, I think, have also been very fortunate. I have never had a participant display any type of homophobia, transphobia, anything like that. I've had participants who don't know a lot of the queer community and will mention that and say, you know, I don't know much about this, but I've never had someone say anything homophobic or transphobic to me. What I will say is that a lot of my participants have been the target of homophobia or transphobia by their abusers. And that can be either directed towards them or it can be directed, a lot of the times it's directed towards their children. And that is a very real form of abuse and it's very, very traumatic for the participants. And that is something that can be passed on as vicarious trauma to me. Um, but in, I mean, with my coworkers, I've never had an issue. There's, there's a lot of us who are part of the queer community. Um, I think there are times in which I feel like, yes, like I don't feel like I belong in this movement, but I think that's mostly coming from some more mainstream mainstream organizations where the dialogue around domestic violence is very gendered. It's very, it's through a very white colonial cisgender heterosexual lens. And that can be really challenging sometimes. But for me, what sort of affirms my desire that I do belong and to keep doing this work is reconnecting with my own organization and our values. And of course, connecting with my participants, because to me, they are they are always what keeps me going, is working with these people, helping them meet their goals, um, and helping them move forward. I think, so the process through which LGBTQ people seek services through us is pretty much the same. So we usually do not take any type of outside referral. The person has to call the crisis line. We do the intake, we move through there. Um, I will say that a lot of my participants were working with the Latino community. So there's a large portion of participants who are here and don't have papers or here and as part of their advocacy, it would be seeking some sort of immigration relief. And I think for people in the LGBTQ plus community or participants who belong to that community, that can be more challenging because I feel like we have to sort of explain them a little more and that can involve sharing personal details that my other participants who are in a relationship who are in sort of an opposite gender relationship wouldn't have to share. So that can be really challenging. But I think overall, like my organization really does value all of the advocates. They value all of our input. Um, they value their LGBTQ advocates and their staff members. And I really haven't had a bad experience with the organization or with my participants. And I know that that's not always the case, so I feel very fortunate and can only speak to my own experience, but yeah. I think um, what what we're really trying to, to look to, I guess, answering question number three, um, is like when we're when we're working with survivors at women's advocates, I think the challenge that we're kind of having now is we've all come around to the fact that yes, um, survivors who aren't straight exist and also experience domestic violence. 
and we have services that are available to them. Um, I think the part, the next step that we're we're taking right now and that we're like doing a lot of brainstorming about is how do we tell them that we're here? <laughs> um, how do we make sure the people know that we exist and we're here for them? Um, so trying to be more targeted and creative in um, where we go to um, to advertise our program, to like the kind of language that we include on our materials. Um, I think we're having a lot of conversations about like where and how to do that now because um, queer people have been saying to us as women's advocates for a long time, like, hey, we need your, we need your help, we need you. And we've been saying, we're here for you. Um, but it's like, not everybody knows that yet. Um, so I think the challenge we're having right now is like getting the word out, and making sure that we're not betraying people's trust when they do trust us enough to come in for support. Uh, I would um, say for me, I uh, think operating from the framework of transformative justice and I, with that, I want to give such a huge shout out, I think, from my political um, upbringing and a lot of the uh, philosophies I carry derive from Black and Brown feminists uh, with the likes of Marsha P. Johnson, Sylvia Rivera, um, Bell Hooks, that understood that people enter in their own awakenings at different points and um, that we all deserve liberation and we will get there together. And I think with that, it, it draws for me a lot of compassion in the ways that when I work with people who may not understand um, uh, what queer people are, what trans people are, I think so long as there's opportunity to um, give people the tools and there, there's curiosity to learn, uh, whether it's a client or a coworker, I think I give grace by that and know that when you know people have breaking points such as myself, it's becoming a lot, we have a village of people who are queer, who understand the, the burden to educate and choose not to educate, um, to go into that, the place of solace and commune together and to vent. Uh, and it's important to have that, especially in your professional settings because you can't always go off on people. <laughs> um, <laughs> and so I, um, I'd say, yeah, we, we always, in our at least our professional line of work, give people the grace to 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 learn, to know that they have the capacity to change, and that we connect our work together. That when we have people who are coming in strictly for um, domestic violence work, and these are oftentimes just straight women, that they get involved with some of our queer justice work. That they understand, you know, um, we also. Um, we care about queer and trans people in our liberation to um, uh, a world free of gender-based violence. And we've had banquets, our, our domestic violence banquet in October where we bring in um, our drag queens that we work and build relationships with. Um, we have youth come and speak about their experience of being queer. And we have also parents who are not queer themselves, but um, are wanting to connect with other parents that are, uh, supporting their own queer children and having to build their own network of uh, being accountable to their to themselves as um, queer or uh, as cis straight parents that are also loving on queer children and queer people. And so it's beautiful to see that we are um, connecting these points in our works and knowing that we can we can always do more of that. Um, and, you know, I would say that what's so uh, wonderful and, and um, a privilege to have in this um, this role of mine is that we invest in our our queer staff, queer and trans staff, that we are re-examining our policies about what is included for some insurance coverage where people are seeking, um, you know, gender affirming care. Um, what are holidays that we're looking to take off, which is like holiday, uh, pride, maybe pride in the future. And um, we just had Juneteenth off to uh, honor um, the holiday of the uh, emancipation for uh, Black Americans. And so we're, we're really trying to, de I think, rewire um, the ways that our, a lot of our policies can be informed by white supremacy and capitalism and 
see, you know, what is the container we want to create? Um, B is that we serve a lot of marginalized communities, but um, we also have staff who come from those very communities and how can we reflect to treat um, our, our service providers well as they also take care of our community members. Um, and so I think that's something really beautiful and really powerful that is happening. And I think at the root of it all, it's about um, building our practice of care uh, and really leaning into those ancestral practices as Hmong people that we've always known uh, to take care of each other and expanding that to um, the ideas of whose who's humanity matters, which is all of us, of course, but that's gotta be inclusive of queer and trans folks. Um, and our counterparts who don't know that, they, they have to. If they're not, they're going to know about it uh, because uh, we, we've been here. We've always been here, even if history doesn't always say so. Sean, I'm curious about your experience with men as peacemakers, too. Like, what was, what, what's that like? Yeah. Um... I, you know, definitely echo some folks here. Like I have um, felt super supported here uh, as a queer trans guy. Uh, when I had first started about uh, seven-ish, gosh, seven-ish years ago, um, it was like right after I had come out as trans. Um, and I remember my interview for that, that first position I had, um, I had to say, hey, just so y'all know, like if you hire me, I have top surgery scheduled in a couple of months and so I'll have to take time off. And there are those, those considerations. And I think, yeah, right from the get-go, um, the leadership and everyone here has um, supported me um, and all of our queer and trans folks who are um, here right now, um, I think, um map has done a really great job of looking at personnel policies things like holidays i remember a couple years back my ed had come to me and said hey you know i think we need to have like a trans holiday off you know can we should we like make trans day of visibility a paid holiday uh, and i was like that's a great idea except um actually could it actually be trans day of remembrance that could be that paid holiday because that's kind of a tough day you know, for so many folks in our community to really honor and memorialize the folks we've lost um, due to transphobic hate and violence. Um, and so, uh, you know, when I think about the community here um, within our organization, one of the other things I really love is that um, we talk a lot about being in and of the community. And so MAP has always really strongly valued building relationships with other community organizations. Um, and sort of as I was co-founding and, and starting um, Trans Plus back in the day, now Trans Northland, um, they came alongside us and helped support us. Uh, they sponsor multiple events of ours throughout the year, every year, you know, and they say, don't even put our name on this, you know, like we just want you to know that we support this and we're gonna help get the word out about these events. And so, um, yeah, just that piece about how we as, as um, advocates and direct service providers can really focus intentionally on building relationships with the queer and trans organizations that are around us, because I feel like, you know, we are experts of our own experience um, and so if we don't have those relationships, like the advocacy is not actually going to be inclusive because folks don't know unless they're in relationship with those of us in the community, um, those of us who choose to educate and who choose to have those conversations around accountability and, and how do we make fo folks know that they, they belong um, regardless of their gender identity and sexual orientation. Um, and then just one more piece I would share is like early on when I started the work, um, you know, we would get calls a lot from uh, mainly trans folks who were looking to get into a shelter, who needed help, who were experiencing violence in, of a lot of different forms. Um, and at the time, there were just so many stories of folks being turned away from the shelters here in town. Um, and that you know, they wouldn't accept trans women, um, they wouldn't accept non-binary and gender expansive folks um, all of those years ago. 
and now um you know a lot of them are doing that work to really like look at how do we provide the services the safety um the care that our community members need um how do we also like help educate other cis straight survivors who are in those shelters you know because that's where oftentimes there's some conflict that happens um that i've heard about um but really it started back in the day of just like hey so and so at this organization knows a little something about queer and trans folks and so i would just directly send folks to that person don't call the hotline go to jill at this organization because i know that she's a safe person and so um i just can't speak you know enough about how important it is to build those relationships with folks um because you know we are what you know one of our mantras here is that we are all connected um, so I may not have all the answers or know the right place to go, but if I have that relationship with someone at Esperanza United or PAVSA up here in Duluth, like I can say, hey, I don't know, but let me connect you with Felix at EU. Let me connect you um, with these safe people who care and, and will take the time to really help folks find those services. Awesome. So let's talk about where we're going. Before we do that, let's do another engagement question. Or actually, sorry, we're gonna we're gonna go back to our questions. I lied. So for question one, we're gonna do the same same thing like we did for the last one. I'm gonna read the questions and I'm gonna open up the panelists. So how would you like your organization or other organizations be better advocates for LGBTQ plus people in the future? And what institutional and policy changes need to happen to better assist LGBTQ plus survivors? Question two, how do you see your own relationship to your identity and advocacy advancing in the future? What do you want your legacy to be in the anti-violence movement? And question three, how do you see the needs of LGBTQ plus clients changing in the future? 10 years from now, what will the movement look like? And then, so I want to start this one with Sang. Yeah, thank you so much for all these thoughtful questions, by the way. These are such brilliant questions. Um, for me, I would say um, I would like to see, I think, um, more people who are not just queer and trans seeing their stake in this work uh, of advocating on behalf of LGBTQ people, um, knowing that our, you know, our fight for freedoms is really so tied together intimately, if we think about it. Um, I, I really believe that the forms of violence that um, are oftentimes perpetrated in a lot of our communities, especially marginalized communities, it's very often intentional, it's purposeful to keep us disenfranchised and disempowered and to be divided amongst each other. Um, and so I, what I preach about the work that we're doing Transform Generations and, and tying our work together, not that um, we don't wanna continue the work of being in silo, that we share about what's going on in our work and that um, for, the, for the women who are straight and cis coming through, um, be introduced to, you know, the other participants or um, other colleagues of ours as safe as can be um, who are queer and be, in, um, be know that, let it be known that, you know, we, we really, I think, have a plight against patriarchy that we can band together and really dismantle the violence that comes from it. Um, and so with that, it's about um, bring our analysis together as with um, feminism and queer justice um, and tying those together. It's all those things, um, you know, the, the term uh, coined by Kimberly Crenshaw, it's intersectionality, it's intersecting with one another. And so, um, you know, with that, I think there's with the, the some of the outreach programs that, that we do, where we bring in um, long drag queens to read to families or participants we serve. Uh, we we talk about some of the policies that are attacking uh, queer and trans people right now that are being debated in um, legislation in Congress and how how we can rally together. What are ways to get involved politically so that we can activate um, uh, those ways of organizing in our communities as well. Um, and then also 
give the give the language as it's like it, very much so in English as it's expanding as there's new terminology coming out every day. What is it looking like in Hmong that we can um, give name to non-binary folks? I think some we have really wonderful people who are coming up with terms like uh, um I had someone, uh, an elder really, identify me as a non-binary person as Tsineng Panya, which means man and woman, um, loosely translated it. That kind of just speaks to kind of the in-between experience of genders. Um, and so creating that terminology, creating those languages so that we can have um, words to identify, to have shared language with each other. Um, and, you know, ultimately, I would, I would go down to question number three is that I, I think so much of our community is still um, dealing with poverty, uh, dealing with inaccessibility to um, basic need services and basic um, safety things like housing, food, um, and then for queer and trans people, family that's supportive of them. Uh, and so I think being able to still see that those folks are not slipping through the cracks that we don't see um, uh, successful attempts uh, uh, or not even attempts, but successful um, cases of taking their lives uh, uh, because they felt like they they weren't accepted or loved in this world. Um, but we still we still care and tend to those folks, um, knowing that there is, especially for Hmong LGBTQ folks, people here that love you, people here that want to meet you that you just haven't got to yet. Uh, and that there are services to support you um, navigating family violence, um, school school violence, uh, work violence, that we we all want to go along the journey and win together and to be free and um, ending, yeah, with our mission of ending gender-based violence in Hmong and Southeast Asian communities. So that's that's my my answer to these questions. I was just thinking, saying about um, about part of part of this the liberation, like needing to include basic needs. Um, like you can't. I mean, some of some of the people who have been fighting, a lot of the people who have been fighting for liberation, are doing so because they don't have two pennies to rub together. But I also know that being hungry makes movement work much harder. Um, not having a place to stay consistently that's safe makes movement work much harder. Um, and so making sure, like, I really hope that, um, I really hope that in the next 10 years, we can all get our needs met. I um, truly, when I think about um, where I hope the community is headed um, and where the, the anti-violence movement is headed, I, I want everybody to eat well. Um, like literally and metaphorically. Um, and I, I hope, I hope because there's a lot of, there's a lot of splintering happening in a lot of our communities right now. Um, and I think that's making, some of that is making it easier for us to be divided and not come together against like the true, uh, the true forces of oppression. Um, and so in the next 10 years, what I'm really hoping for is um, all of us realizing that even though our experiences are different, um, by and large, our, our fight is the same. Um, and I hope that we, we trust each other enough to, um, to get our hands dirty together instead of everybody getting their hands dirty separately. Um, yeah, I hope we I hope we do this. Whatever we do, I hope we do it together. I think kind of in line with that, something that women's advocates has developed in the within the last year or two is a survivor advisory council, which is made up of folks that have either gone through programming with us and now are now living in community, or um we have some folks that are in, in community, haven't stepped foot in shelter, but have had some interaction with us and um have kind of accessed some services from us in the past. And I think in line with, you know, getting our, getting, really getting our hands dirty together, like, I would love to see what that group comes up with, because they have had a really fantastic ability to pinpoint 
the gaps in services I think that we all know exist, but they've not only pinpointed them and gone like, this is what we wanna see happen with this. This is how we wanna see you address it. So I think as staff, we're gonna come up with some great ideas, but I also wanna see what our folks that are in the community, part of the queer community, supporting the queer community and our survivors, what are they seeing as the needs? What are they seeing as the work that they wanna see us doing? And then coming together and have, seeing how we can facilitate that. How about Hanley or Sean? I really want to hear both of your answers. Who wants to go? Okay, Sean, you go. Sure. Um, yeah, just feeling really grateful for this whole conversation. So um, I think um, what's coming up for me is I think we're just going to see the numbers of folks um, growing because I think, you know, younger folks are identifying more and more as queer, trans, gender expansive. So I think that our shelters, our direct services, our primary prevention agencies really need to think about that because we are seeing that trend just really steadily grow and increase, which, um, you know, not that there haven't always been queer folks, right? But these these younger generations are are feeling much more comfortable and confident, I think, to be out, to be uh, real about their their full identities. Um, so just preparing for that, and, and I hope to see shelters continuing to do the work of um, looking how to support trans women, uh, trans men, and trans mask folks who are fleeing violence, um, non-binary people um gosh and then i think just in general for those of us who do the advocacy work um i think a big thing that i've been learning about recently is just like the amazing work that we all already are doing um can only be like exemplified and um, expanded when we actually have a focus on deeply like caring for ourselves um in a, like a self-care kind of way but like in a deeper way where it's not just about self-care it's about community care um where we can take the time to say hey did you eat a meal today or have you been working nine straight hours with all of the folks who need help um i think that our work and our uh impact within community can only grow as we are learning to like take care of ourselves as we're doing this work so that there's less of us burning out. Um, there's less folks um, dealing with suicidal ideation and those types of things because this work is so heavy. Um, and we all hold a lot of really hard stories, I think. So just, um, I would love to see that, like a, a bigger um, uh, focus on healing and care uh, for those of us doing this work. Yeah, I mean, I have a lot of thoughts about this, but I'll keep it quick. Um, so I think that one of the things that really needs to change, because this is just something that's very important to me, um, is that organizations really need to stop limiting themselves to only serving people who identify as women. If we're going to support the LGBTQ community, that has to stop. We have to be able to serve gender expansive folks you have to serve people who identify as male it's just something that's going to have to change and unfortunately I think a lot of that is also coming from a systemic place of oppression that a lot of the funding that we receive is going to be tied specifically to women and unfortunately that can be something that just ends up oppressing our queer community even more because they're not e able to access the services that they really need and get the support for the situations they're facing. Um, I hope that some of the oppressive systems like white supremacy, the huge amount of rising tides of homophobia and transphobia, I hope that these are things that fade away um, in the next 10 years because I think the attack on the LGBTQ community and also of course our communities of color is a very real threat that poses a risk to people's lives, honestly, at this point. And so I think echoing what Mary Beth said, like 
I want to see that everyone's basic needs are met, that they can feel a sense of safety and security in their communities um, and go from there because we have to make sure that people are able to eat, that they're housed and help them exist under some of these really oppressive systems that are honestly trying to crush our communities. Um, but yeah. And now we've hit 2.30. So thank you. Thank you all for being a part of this panel. I wish it could be longer because we've got so much more stuff to talk about. So 2024, we're, let's come back with this panel again. So I'm going to leave everybody's contact information for from the panel. I'm going to leave it here for a brief second. If you want to screenshot it again, these, these are going to be sent to you in the and the follow-up from the presentation. Before I end, I'm gonna talk a little bit about pop-up advocacy, which I promised to do. So Women's Advocates does pop-up advocacy at Rondo Community Library on Tuesdays and at the St. Paul Opportunity Center on Thursdays. Feel, come, feel free to come see me and my coworker Rose, who is amazing. Um, again, this is part of Ramsey County. Uh, they, we are funded, we are trusted Trusted Messengers, so we are partially funded by Ramsey County. And then we have our online survivor support group, which is, uh, we have two, two uh, uh, parallel support groups. One is a women's only group and one is an open gender group. So if you or someone you know is experiencing domestic violence or has experienced domestic violence, we are here and we will start next session in October. Uh, please feel free to do our post panel survey. Uh, that link will go into the chat as well, which I will put right here. And you can stay connected with Women's Advocates. We have a YouTube channel. This, uh, this presentation will go up onto our YouTube. You can follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Uh, we love new followers. We love to stay connected. So thank you all again for doing this amazing panel. I wish it could be longer because there's there's just so much to talk about and and there's just not enough time in the day to talk about it. So thank you again for coming and being a part of this panel and thank everyone for attending. I'm thrilled. So thanks all. Thank right. you, fellow panelists. Bye everybody.